So good afternoon, uh, all. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, a civil engineering department and uh, civil engineering as association, I welcome you all uh, for this guest lecture on sustainable construction materials uh, by our uh, uh, our guest, uh, Mr. Gaurav Chandra Bridani, uh, PMRF scholar, uh, IIT Madras. And uh, I thank, I sincerely thank our HOD and uh, our SPC management for giving us, I mean, uh, for allowing us to, I mean, for uh, conducting this uh, guest lecture. And and I would like to uh, give a, uh, a intro about our uh, guest of the day, uh, Mr. Gaurav Chandra Bridani, before he starts the uh, start his session. Mr. Gaurav Chandra Bridani is a Prime Minister Research Fellowship a Scholar. Uh, Structural Engineering Division, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, it has been uh, involved in has been developing a novel numerical uh, techniques for solving fracture boundary value problems in modern mechanics using meshless basis uh, function uh, functions for implicit constitutive material models. His research interests are the mechanics of deformable bodies, nonlinear mechanics, a finite element method and then meshless methods and the constitutive modeling. And uh, Mr. Uh, Gaurav had uh, completed his uh, uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, from the uh, College of Technology, Pantnagar, under the Govind Bala uh, and University of Agriculture and Technology, Pantnagar. And uh, has, uh, he had completed his uh, master's in structural engineering uh, from the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, IIT Madras, in the year 2018. And he had also served as, uh, as a, uh, it also worked as assistant professor in the civil engineering department of uh, Graphic Era Hill University, Dehradun, and GLA University, Mamadra. And uh, so, with this uh, introduction, uh, I'd like to hand over the session to our guest, Mr. Gaurav Chandra Over to Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, respected HUD ma'am and the uh, uh, administration of SBC, I thank to them for this opportunity they extended me to deliver this uh, lecture, uh, which is being a part of the uh, teaching assistant work of the Prime Minister Research Fellowship. And uh, I thank uh, Sir also to arranging this nice talk and uh, managing this thing. So uh, welcome to all and uh, a very good afternoon to all the students, uh, first year, second year, third year, fourth panel year, those who are there in the meeting. I hope some of you have already interacted with me, mostly third year or final year. Uh, we had similar sessions in September, October 2021, and even in uh, April uh, or May 2022 also. So it has been quite long because I was involved in some other work, so I could not able to come back, but now I am back also. And I'm, uh, I, I am positive that I'll keep this session more frequently. Uh, now, I think because most of the students are first year and second year, and I think they have not been uh, exposed by our other PMRF uh, fellows about the research opportunities which are there in IIT Madras. So it is kind of a duty of me also to tell you what all the areas are there, what all the methods are there to get into IIT for their research career. So uh, I'll take some 15 to 20 minutes to explain you that, uh, so that you will be uh, be able to take a, a better judge, uh, better your or your career a better step you can take after your final year, and you can even prepare in between. So uh, I'll share my another screen to just uh, show you uh, some of the things. So. You, I hope you can see my screen here. So I uh, thought to just a little bit explain you how the things happened. So to talk about IIT Madras. So I, as I know that you all are BTECs here. So you have certain opportunities here. 
So uh, if, if you are planning to go in research, and especially if you are more interested in uh, in the things you study at your BTEC, uh, in your BTEC course, uh, it could be from anything. It could be from uh, structural engineering. It could be from water resource. It could be from transportation. I'm not going as a subject specific, but I'm telling as in general. So how you can find better opportunities for yourself at IIT Madras. So, uh, so because you have two ways as you are in BTEC, so there are two ways you can uh, shape your career. One is you appear for the graduate uh, aptitude test for engineers. So it's gate exam, which is there. So one is you can appear for that exam and then you can secure a seat in masters mtech so that you can do also and you can choose iit madras or any other iit by getting the required rank and all so from there that is the way to get mtech and even from gate you can even join ms courses also that is master in science so this is ms actually by research okay so mtech is basically here a two years program okay so uh, you will be having uh, in the Amtech program, you will be having funding from MHRD. So there is a certain fund which is given as a stipend for every month. Then there is the MS program, which is by research. So it is also officially somewhere two to 2.5 years. Okay, it depends on the caliber of the students, how fast he can complete that program. And there also the similar uh, stipend is there, which is available in the Amtech. So they, these are two ways to uh, do it using the gate exam. Other way of coming is through the direct PhD. One way is direct PhD. So I think this is something new maybe for some of you. So what happens in direct PhD that you appear for, appear for uh, interview and viva voc at IIT Madras based on your based on your uh, BTEC grades whatever grade you have got based on that grades and then you are tested for your uh, knowledge from the interview as well as 5OC and sometimes written also written tests also there Okay, so from this, if you qualify this, so you have an opportunity to do uh, MS plus PhD. And it is somewhere six, 6.5 years program. So in this, you will get both MS and PhD in six to 6.5 years. I, I, I hope it is uh, only six years because uh, mostly, uh, the students who are selected in this program, they, they the scrutiny process is very uh, tough. So they are very brilliant. Uh, so mostly they finish it by six years. So this is one of the way. And in between also, if you want, you can apply for the PMRF Research Fellowship. Research Fellowship. This is a different fellowship. Okay. So this. Here you get the MHRD fund, MHRD, which is now MOE, Ministry of Education. So you get uh, this fund, but this is a different fund. PMRF fund is a different fund. So you apply for uh, PMRF fellowship being in the MSPHD program here. You apply for the PMRF program. And if you get selected through the scrutiny process, then you can convert it to the research PMRF fellowship. Another way yeah, that is if you have done your MTech from IIT Madras or any other centrally funded institute. So from there, what you can do, you can apply for PhD from here. You can apply for regular PhD, we call it regular PhD. So in regular PhD, again, you have a uh, written test, written test plus Viva OC or interview. And from there, you get the admission. And uh, from that, if you want, again, you can apply for fellowship. 
okay so here in the regular phd who have already is for those who have already completed the mtech so uh, if you because you guys are in btech so this path is more relevant for you if you don't want to go in this way so uh, you can get for the direct phd program where you will get both degrees ms and phd in six years and uh, there is fellowship given for uh, first one and one and a half years as ms and then later on it is converted to the fellowship which is given equivalently to a phd students so these are the ways and uh, in pmrf as you know as you may be aware of that so in pmrf the fellowship is directly funded from moe and it is uh, you are also given research contingency fund here research contingency fund which is approximately 2 lakhs per year for a period of 2 to 3 years so this fund you can use for your research activities suppose if somebody is having an experimental work so he can use this fund he or she can use this fund for procuring various materials setting up the test and various other things which are there various other contingency which comes in between and if suppose you are having more of the numerical work or simulation work so if you need to purchase some specific software or you need to purchase some specific terminal and machine which is higher end machine so for that also you can use this fund uh, to uh, your uh, uh, to complete your research as well as you can use this fund uh, here to uh, go for uh, certain international conference national conferences which are held every year due to covid there was some problem it was not being held for some particular period of time now it has already started so that is also there and similarly in the program of uh, ms phd also you get uh, 1.5 lakh uh, uh, per course so as this is six year course you will get a 1.5 lakh rupees fund for international conference and similarly in the regular phd same rule is there of rupees 1.5 lakh fund is there for uh, international conference or plus material sometimes if, if you don't have conferences then you can use it in the other way around so uh, that is there then there are other things available also that you can use the funds for procuring certain certain journal articles which are not available on the online website or certain uh, if you want to join certain uh, certain organizations kind which 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 are uh, which are having a particular subject area suppose in concrete there is icj or there is some other uh, particular uh, journals which are there or some uh, bodies are there if you want to join those bodies that can also be availed from this fund so uh, and this is a pretty good uh, i would say is a pretty good uh, opportunity which is given to a scholar here and uh, you can use of this uh, thing and uh, there is other supports also so there is other alumni funds also if if, if there is need for more so other for alumni funds is also available which can be given case to case basis so that is uh, brief i think and uh, uh, I, I hope that some of you guys uh, apply after your BTEC or if you go for MTEC, then you apply for research. So that is more important. And uh, uh, if you have any doubt, uh, please feel free to ask me. Uh, you can post a question in the chat also regarding this process. And uh, uh, from now, I'll move to the presentation today. I hope uh, you can see my screen. 
So I think it is visible to you all. So, uh, so uh, today's topic uh, is uh, sustainable construction material. So as I was told by sir also that there will be some first year and second year students. Uh, basically, we had earlier planned for them, but we have third years and final years also. So, but I kept in my mind the first years and mostly first years because it is uh, they, they, that is a transition phase for them from uh, school education to a university college education and something which we they are going to they came to do here the engineering. So, so I thought of to the keep the transition little slow. So what I thought like I'll have this session in two parts. So today uh, we I will mostly talk about sustainability in a better way, manner, which could be also I think they maybe the first year students maybe uh, studying in their first year maybe in environmental sciences subject or some other subject. So I'll go a little slow in a manner that uh, they should able to understand that where the problem lies. Okay. So first of all, it is very important to uh, identify what is the problem. So uh, being said that it is not like always the uh, the technology which is available. It is the only technology which can be used. So there are many things uh, and uh, that's how the the engineering society or that's how the the community engineering community progresses. So you do research on new uh, methodologies new materials, new techniques to get better results. So that's how the research goes on. And that is basically the purpose of research. If we say that the available technology is sufficient and it is doing everything good, then it puts a halt on the research. Then where we are going to do the research. So I have kept this presentation, uh, made this presentation by keeping my in the first years and some second year students so that the, the transition for them should be uh, easy and in the second part of this i'll mostly deep dive into the material aspect uh, as well as the construction practices aspect which is also more important so uh, let's start so first of all uh, it, uh, we had this topic of sustainable construction material so uh, although it is not the core subject of my research uh, what i'm doing here at it Madras, but it's still uh, it is a very fascinating subject and why it is because it is going to impact everyone. It doesn't matter. I'm civil engineer. I'm electrical engineer. I'm mechanical engineer. The impact of sustainability is everywhere. So it is a combined effect from all the backgrounds. Okay, so the word sustainability or sustainable is more important. So we have to first identify what is sustainable, what is not sustainable, then only we can proceed forward. So in that term, uh, let's go for that first. So something sustainable, as, as you go with the meaning of the word sustainable, it means which, something which can sustain in itself, independent, something which can sustain independently. Okay, so that is the meaning. So here, the term independently is very important because uh, that is going to Tell us how we can achieve it, how we can do it, because sustainable term can be added to many things, development, economics, sustainable economics, construction. Okay, sustainable, uh, there are sustainable practices in, in other fields also. So the word when attaches to other uh, areas, it changes the meaning. But the thing is, the meaning of the word sustainable itself is something which is independent. So coming to the uh, the development part so if we see what is sustainable development because uh, as we as civil engineers uh, uh, the 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 prime objective as you can see of our engineering which has been there since its origin is the uh, development of the infrastructure of the country or world whatever you can say okay so in our our case we can say our country india so development, that is which development we are basically focusing as a civil engineer on the infrastructure level. Infrastructure means various structures. It could be anything. It could be building structures. It could be dam structure. It could be any other structure, any, any military installation, anything. So the sustainable development 
how it is being defined that it should meet the need the development uh, we should do a development in a sense that it should meet the need of the present which which we are we are we are the present generation and without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs so we have to do development in a sense that we should be able to meet our needs whatever we want to construct or whatever we want to implement we should be able to do that but we should also keep in mind the future generations because they also are going to use because we have some limited thing in this world we have some limited thing and from that tool of limited thing we are also using our forefathers also use the same thing we are also using the same thing and our future generation also need to use the same thing and the tool of things is not infinite it is some finite so we have to think about that that we have to judiciously use the available pool of resources we have in a way that we should able to uh, fulfill our needs and at the same time we should have a thinking for our future generation so that they should also be able to fulfill their own needs so that the resources which we have in this pool should be sufficient for our future generation that is the meaning of the sustainable development now the some uh, some might say that like okay it is it is like we are worrying for our future generation yeah in one sense it is yes it is worrying but it is not only related to the worry it has many implications which we will see in the in this presentation why sustainable development has become very important it is not only that we are worrying for the future generation they should they won't get the uh, resources there is something more problematic which can happen to the present generation also and that is the way it has been taken so seriously at the government level uh, around the world and at, it has become a very important part of our day to day so coming to the the needs which we say so we i am using a word here needs so there are certain resources as i told that pool of resource also con contain one subset which is a natural resource okay so there could be man made resource and there could be a natural resource so what is a natural resource so any or everything which is available on earth and which is naturally occurring on earth is a natural resource okay okay so you see anything which is naturally occurring not being uh, made by man or not being done by any human resource so that thing is a natural resource so when i say about the needs which we have to uh, uh, which we have to meet our needs and our future generation needs so the needs fulfilled by these natural resource this is more important because in that pool of resources the natural resource is the one component which is almost kind of fixed in our lifetime if we see our lifetime so it is fixed if we see the lifetime of our planet then it can vary okay so you as you know that planet lives around for billions of years so in that lifetime the amount or the concentration of those natural resources it could change but in the lifetime of humans it has it doesn't change much so that is why because it remains constant and it has been constantly used for several decades so that is why we have to take care we have to properly and judiciously use those resources today so that the needs of the future generation should also be met now so to give you a, a example of natural resources so as i told everything and anything which is naturally occurring is a natural resource so you can see uh, very basic plants and animals okay then you can say air which is there so you breathe air so that is a natural resource then minerals which are there you nobody has put the mineral here the mineral has been already there in the earth surface or crust of the earth so minerals these are natural resources. water is a very important natural resource then energy so energy you are getting suppose from the some of the minerals or some fuel like you can say uh, fossil fuels which is coal 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 uh, petroleum so from there you are getting energy so that is a also natural resource even the sun's energy is also a natural resource is a natural occurring thing and then soil so sometimes this uh, component is been not used the soil i have in, uh, included it it is very important and we'll see later on why i have included soil so it has certain role and how it can impact how it can change the course of action how it can change the way things are or, or has been through in the past so that is why i have included soil also because it is also a natural resource okay you might have read in your uh, in the course of ecology or in the course of 
uh, rock formation and all, where how the soil is created, how the flow of river, it takes the uh, igneous rocks and disintegrates into the smaller formation and uh, makes different other kinds of soils. Okay, so broadly, I will I have put here broadly some of the natural resources which are available. Now, there is some certain kind of classification. And why I'm doing this all, uh, maybe some of you students may be feeling that it's very trivial or very basic. But why I'm doing this? Because if, if I don't do this, you won't be able to understand or you won't be able to pinpoint that where we need the sustainable development. At what exactly point? Because uh, the best way is to do it smartly. Even the sustainable development, if you do it smartly, you can able to achieve more then doing it everywhere so you have to pinpoint certain aspects of the um, of the of the journey of life and specifically if we talk, if i talk about civil engineering profession so it is not like that for all the things which i am showing here you can apply the principles there are certain things which you can in which you can apply the principles and you will get a better results so that's why i am doing this as, as a little basic thing so coming to the classification, so we can classify the resources into uh, based on the life forms. Okay, so when you can say the biotic and the abiotic thing. So biotic will be those who are derived from life forms, which forms which are having life or they are li living. So animals, humans, plants, and even some uh, coal. So coal is being derived from uh, animal and uh, plant. Uh, this uh, uh, when they have been buried in deep into the earth, it has derived from that. So fuel is also kind of biotic. And then we can say in abiotic, like metals, rocks, water. This is a non-living entity. So it is an abiotic form. Okay. So the way we have to treat those two things, biotic and abiotic, will be different. The way we have to implement will be different. In respect of civil engineering profession, if we see, say, so how we can uh, implement some sustainable development practices or some materials which will uh, less we less harmful will be less harmful for the earth can be uh, applied in 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 not on all these things. I can't apply in animal, human, plant or metal everywhere. It's not possible. I can apply in certain few places, and that we have to figure out first where I can apply it, where I can use it, and then we can see what are the outcomes it is giving to us. Because at the end, what is important is the outcome. Okay. Then we have a classification based on exhaustibility. So. As you can say that there are two types of resources we have of energy. We can say renewable sources of energy and we have non-renewable sources. I think all you might have studied this in your plus two level. So we have renewable sources like sunlight, wind. These are renewable sources. They renew themselves. And then we have non-renewable sources like fossils, coal, petroleum. These all things are non-renewable. Then minerals, these are non-renewables. Okay. So these are non-renewable sources. In minerals, you have this nuclear uh, 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 material, which is used nowadays to generate power. So these are also non-renewable because there is certain amount of uh, nuclear fuel available. So it is a non-renewable thing. Yeah, but the energy thing, uh, the energy output of the uh, of the uh, nuclear fuel is more higher than the sunlight, or you can say wind, or even other fossil fuels. Okay. So this is the broad classification. So again, this classification will tell us later on that where we can use where, which of the uh, energy sources we can minimize, which we can use more. Because then only we can expect a better results in, sen in the sense which we are trying to. Okay. So now coming to the fact that what happens if we don't do sustainable development? What happens if, if we are not practicing sustainable development? So there has been in the past a lot many of phenomena which has made us to think that, OK, we have to do or change something so that the the, the process or the the effects which they which we were seeing in our environment and in our uh, localities so that it get reduced. So one of the important thing which has been observed in the early 21st century is the global warming and it has been talked for since 19th, uh, uh, 90s 1980s but it has been mostly seen global warming as in the late 20s 20th and 21st century is the global warming and how it has happened from the greenhouse gases which is being produced 
So as you may aware that what happens in global warming that there are some of the gases which in the which are some are there in the earth surface already since uh, uh, the uh, origin of the earth like carbon dioxide carbon monoxide these gases are already been there in the earth surface but what happened due to excessive use of some of the fossils due to excessive use of some of the materials we have uh, knowingly it is not like unknowingly we have knowingly released a lot more amount of carbon dioxide carbon monoxide and some other other uh, gases in the atmosphere which has the capacity to absorb the heat of the earth uh, sunlight this the radiation coming from the sunlight that radiation energy is absorbed by those gases including carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide what happens because uh, the atmosphere at the earth surface is very delicate so even if the temperature of the whole earth surface even if it increases by a degree or two it impacts a lot because you might have seen various videos about various uh, melting of various uh, 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 polar ice flooding of various coastal cities so those things have happened because of the rise in temperature and one of the major cause of rise in temperature is the greenhouse effect which is showing as being shown as global warming here so global warming is nothing when you when when the industrialization which has happened has released knowingly some of the gases in the atmosphere and the concentration of those gases has increased in so much bigger amount that higher amount that it those gases now capture more and more sun radiation and due to that the earth surface temperature increases and that causes lot many issues as i told melting of the polar ice and change in some of the climates then flooding of the coastal cities okay so the as the coastal cities flood the land surface which is already around some 20 even 20 to 21% of the earth surface is further reduced further reduced so because of that we are losing our land also because of the rise in the water level okay so that is one effect we can say if we have if we are not going to do uh, development in sustainable manner other is the ozone layer depletion so again what happened that we as the technology developed we got to use various type of uh, technological tools for our own ease like i can give you an example of this here as like air conditions which we use in our labs in our colleges everywhere in our homes so what they do they emit a gas which are known as chlorofluorocarbons we call them as cfc chlorofluorocarbons so again what this chlorofluorocarbons is this gas is is a lighter gas so it moves upwards in the atmosphere when it is released and when it moves upwards so after troposphere when it meets the ozone layer so there is one ozone layer around the earth surface as you might have already known that it is layer of some particular thickness of some 2 to 3 kilometers of uh, thickness and that layer has nascent oxygen actually so it has oxygen without uh, o2 means it's not o2 it's o okay it's a single ion so it's actually ion of oxygen and what it does that the harmful radiations and especially the ultraviolet radiations coming from the uh, sun ready sun it stops those radiation it reflects those radiation back and what happens when it reflected back those harmful radiation don't reach earth surface and we are safe because those radiations are very harmful they can cause skin cancer they can cause eye irritation and lot more many uh, diseases so that's how the ozone layer protects the earth surface and that's how the life form has developed on the earth so but what happens when this chlorofluorocarbons when they move upward in the atmosphere and when they meet the ozone layer so what happens the ozone the nascent oxygen in the ozone layer it reacts with the chlorofluorocarbons and due to that reaction the nascent oxygen gets converted into oxygen so basically the nascent oxygen which consists constitute the ozone layer is converted into oxygen and comes back to the atmosphere or you can say troposphere it comes back down to the troposphere so what happens the thickness of the layer as the concentration of nascent oxygen decreases the thickness of the uh, ozone layer will reduce and what it causes so this reduce in reduction in the thickness of the ozone layer causes some patches where 
the ozone layer is all together being destroyed. So what happens? This creates a hole. Okay. So it depletes the layer and it creates a hole. And from that particular portion, the ultraviolet, harmful ultraviolet rays of sun can enter in the Earth's surface. They can come. So it, there has been a, a satellite imagery of these uh, depletions, which has shown in how the ozone layer has been depleted in the uh, southern, uh, southern pole, near the southern pole, in near the Antarctica uh, continent. So the problem of release of these chlorofluorocarbons, which are generated from the air condition systems which we have, which are excessively generated because if they are being excessively used, they will do so. They will generate these chlorofluorocarbons. So if we don't take care of the use of uh, ACs in our workplace, home, anywhere, so that will cause the increase in the concentration of these chlorofluorocarbons, which will deplete the layer and cause these harmful ultraviolet radiations to enter in the Earth's surface. So that also is a problem and has been uh, has been uh, judicially being addressed also in many forums of the international level. So that is the second reason I would say. Now coming to the third. So as you know that the soil which is also, uh, as I already told earlier, I showed that to you that the soil is also a naturally occurring mineral and it's a natural resource. So why I am uh, adding, I added that at that point is because it is a very important component because we as a human uh, race, we depend on uh, agricultural produces. So almost 60% of what we consume are based on, are directly based on agriculture produce, okay? so. Uh, these agriculture produce requires better soil conditions. Okay, so if you don't have better soil conditions, then you can't produce the crops because the crop needs a certain degree of minerals of each component, each type: phosphorus, nitrogen, nitrogen oxides. They need those all those uh, things in a proper uh, concentration, and the acidity of the soil as well as the water which is being fed to the plants. So you can't grow some crops in too acidic or too basic environment. So what is happening due to the industrialization, some of the uh, waste of the industry has been released in the common water bodies, which are there, which are also used by people in the village areas, even in the urban cities also. And if you don't filter this water properly, if you don't treat this water properly and you uh, take it or you intake this water, it can cause too much harm. So also that is harm to the human beings, but also this water bodies which are being highly acidified can also destroy the crop which is there on the field if it comes to the field. So this acidification actually increases the cost of treatment of the water because later on anyway, if somebody needs to uh, drink that water so make it uh, drinkable so or you can say there is a term called potable so make that water potable you need to employ some of the treatment techniques and as this acidification happens and in some places too much basic water is there so as this happens it is again adding to the cost of the treatment and also it is causing problem to the soil on which the water is flowing so it has double impact as you can say, so it also changes the acidity of the soil also. Okay, and which will impact the crop yield. So the crop which you are growing may not give you the perfect yield which you were expecting or which it should have given. So the acidification of soil as well as of the land mass is also a major concern and is a problem if it's not dealt properly. And mostly this happens from the uh from the landfills which are there in most of the major cities you might uh, be reading these in lot in newspapers or in uh, news so uh, the landfills in various cities there's the garbage is piling up so there is a uh, need for the management of those things and the soil specifically the soil at those places are highly acidic because of the uh, because of the various chemicals which uh, because of the chemicals which are released due to the partial decomposition of the waste product which is lying there. So that acts to the acidity of the soil. 
and uh, in rainy season when this rain happens it take away that chemicals into the nearest water body and which adds to the acidity of the water uh, bodies so that is also a very important part now coming to the desertification so there has been instances where uh, the soil has been rendered desertification and it has turned the uh, uh, good soil into desert desert soil there are many reasons some reasons like excessive use of some of the pesticides or insecticides to get better crop yield okay then another reason it is the excessive uh, uh, deforestation excessive cutting of trees so that also because of that uh, cutting of trees uh, loses uh, loses the the soil loses its shear capacity so what happens uh, when uh, when wind blows the top surface of the soil uh, tops i would say some 20 to 30 35 cm depth of the soil which is high, highly humus because it contains a lot of organic matter and it is very good for the plant growth so it sometimes due to loss of shear capacity it blows away with the air and then if the top soil blows away which is more having more humus which is having more uh, organic content then the uh, the yield capacity of the soil de decreases and also one of the more important reason is overcropping means you are cropping you are exceeding the number of crop season suppose there are two crop seasons in a year you are trying to have three crop season or four crop season. so that also really it it impacts this, uh, the the quality of the soil because the nutrients are lost from the soil and there is a certain amount of time which is required for the soil to regain its nutrients from the atmosphere some of the nutrients like nitrous nitrogen or nit oxides or nitrogen it absorbs from the air so these nutrients if not been fed properly back to the soil it can turn desert and it can turn barren so you, you cannot further uh, uh, grow any uh, crop there or have any yield from those so that is also one of the um, major concern because this is directly related to the uh, as i told that 60% of uh, what we consume directly comes from the agriculture background so if your crop yield if your area or the land mass which is available for cultivation is reduced so the uh, again the pressure on the available land mass which is cultivable increases so because it has to sustain ever growing population so that is also one of the reason that if we don't do the development in a sustainable sense there could be problem then the famous problem of deforestation excessive cutting of trees okay so there has been lot many species which has gone um, because of the excessive uh, deforestation they are no more of some of the plant species even uh, also some of the uh, animal species which have been uh, extinct because of that reason so uh, deforestation is very important as you all know that uh, carbon dioxide is very important for plants uh, for the process of photosynthesis and as i told you the increase in carbon carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere causes more heat to attract causes global warming and in that sense the plants are very important friend of ours because if they will be there they will be able to capture more and more carbon dioxide to balance the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere so that it does not uh, increase much and for that reason we have to have proper strategy in every level so that the deforestation should be um, ca means contained it should not exceed increasingly should not exceed a particular level so that is more important here and uh, it has uh, it, 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 it the deforestation is a is a i would say is a point which has impact on all other things as i told you in the last slide that desertification so it is also directly related to the uh, deforestation so if you cut a lot many trees i told the shear capacity of the soil reduces because the roots of the trees holds the soil around its roots its sub branches of the roots it holds it so uh, it, it in a sense it is protecting the soil and even while heavy flooding while heavy rainfall the plants uh, roots keep the soil intact it does not wash away the soil so easily 
in very high flooding areas it washes away but in normal rains it keeps the soil there itself so in the rainy season so that is also one of the important thing okay then if we see the acidity and of soil and water bodies even these trees if we if we go for trees if we see the trees so those trees are also an important part because they have the capability to get the nutrients from the atmosphere to the soil soil directly also takes that nutrients from the atmosphere but plants also or trees also have this capacity to absorb uh, nutrients from the atmosphere through their roots and which also adds to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to that those minerals which are there also given to the soil so they also enter in the soil so in a way uh, if we look the deforestation will cause a lot of problem not only respected to the trees but it in all other regimes also so it is one of the most important uh, thing to consider and thing to think about okay so uh, and that has been taken up very seriously being by many government organization all over the world and there has been good amount of work on this and it's been going on but we have to uh, we can't say that the work has been done all there should be continuous development there should be continuous monitoring of these things okay then you can see that the climate change you can see nowadays uh, polar ice caps are melting at a faster rate even in the india you see the glaciers in the northern part of the india that is in the himalayas are melting at a faster rate which is causing rise in the level of the rivers which are uh, which originates from the himalayas and uh, which also cause flooding there has been recently uh, there has been a very devastating flood in the regions uh, in the uh, provinces of uh, or the regions nearby to the punjab area in the pakistan side there has been a lot many casualties there a lot many uh, uh, destruction in sense of socio economic so that has been related to the climate change then as you can see uh, uh, the coastal city of chennai has been hit by numerous time by various uh, various uh, cyclones so sometimes the cyclone comes with a warning and it has it has been anticipated that it will come but sometimes it doesn't come with the warning and sometimes it doesn't come as naturally as it used to come sometimes it, it seems like that was not the time or the season of that cyclone but it came anyway so that is the then you see that the um, continuous drought and flood because our country also is uh, kind of mostly uh, around 30 to 40% dependent on the agriculture because of our gdp includes a good amount of agriculture sector so the change in the cycles and the monsoon if it changes then it affects the cultivation if it affects our crop yields okay so not all the portion of the cultivable uh, soil is being uh, irrigated it is not all the areas been irrigated many areas are dependent on the monsoon so if the people or the farmers whose lands are dependent on the monsoon then in order to get the crop yield they have to depend on the rains and if it doesn't rain then there is a drought and 2 uh, 3 years back in 2018 we had declared some of the portion of the country as drought or drought prone so there there are these challenges with us which is happening due to the change in the climate and if i summarize why this climate is changing so whatever reasons i gave before are somewhere contributing to this change in the climate so either it be deforestation either it be the desertification either it be the uh, uh, acidity of the soil and water masses water bodies so these are causing it wildfire there has been last year there has been wildfire in australia in the jungles of australia and in the amazons jungle of amazons so these problems has caused a lot and this we has been termed by us as climate change and there has been markers why this climate change is happening so 
be it the excessive use of fossil fuel, be it the excessive use deforestation, be it the excessive use of various other, various other natural resources, which should have been used judiciously, but we are not doing that or we are lacking in that, which is causing these problems. Okay, so that is the impact if we go don't develop sustainably that is the impact is going to and the impact why uh, so i told earlier that we are not greedy i mentioned one point that we are not greedy i am not saying uh, save it so uh, uh, so that the we are worrying for the future generation so why i mentioned that because it is not even for the future generation even we have to think for our generation because the problems which has been caused due to the not doing the development sustainability has been very catastrophic for our planet as well as for the humanity so that is why it is very important not in the sense that we have to save for our future generation but even we have to save the planet for the current generation because it is started showing some of the trends so it is that's in that sense it's very important so it's not like that we have not taken some of the steps it's not like that we've all have been sleeping we didn't do anything we have done some important things we have achieved some things we have done some remarkable job and for that we should be happy but we should also look forward okay so i can mention some of the important steps or things which we have done like example i can give you a the chipko movement took place it took place in the state of uttarakhand in 1974 at that time it was the part of uttar pradesh so there uh, what was the concern the concern was that uh, in the hilly regions, in the hilly district of Pauri, there is a district called Pauri there. So in the district of Pauri, the, the contractor was assigned a task to cut the trees. They were assigned to cut the trees in the Himalayan hills so that those trees could be uh, sold as the uh, timber. So in order to avoid that and in order to stop this cutting of the trees because it was affecting the local people because uh, the importance of the trees in hilly regions become more important because they have the hills so they are slant they are, the slope is not horizontal it's not zero they have certain slopes so what happens when the rain occurs these trees with their roots they have a grip over these small and big boulders along with the soil and when the rain pores so when it run down the slope of the hill at a very fast rate these trees hold the boulders as well as the soil so that it should not slide and cause the uh, uh, failure of the slope which can eventually block the road or whatever way is there and may even kill the people and may even cut the connectivity of one region of the hill to the other region still that has been the problem in there so in Uttarakhand still that has been problem that in uh, in the rainy season it happens that the landslides happens a lot because of the cutting of the trees it has and these landslides blocks the roads and subsequently it, it disconnects the connectivity between the two cities which is a very important very problematic thing because nowadays there is so the supply is there so it is very difficult to reach the other place so in order to do that we have taken those steps. So this movement started in 1974 against that contractor at that time and against the government. And they started this movement so that they should not able to cut the trees because these trees also sometimes acts as the uh, the timber for the local people also. So uh, the the local villagers of that place, especially ladies, they they put their arms around the tree and they said that if you want to cut the trees you have to go pass through us so that's how this movement uh, went on and uh, one of the key important figure from this movement was uh, late mr sundarlan bahuguna so he was one of the person who shaped this movement so that it was so famous it had a, a international uh, outlook so people were very much uh, they were very much uh, like uh, like they were very much in the sense that how the people can save the trees so how they can they can uh, develop a non-violent movement and they can uh, they can do that to save their own livelihood their own lives in that place so that has happened there and then uh, many things happen in between 
many development things, many research things happen. And what now we can stand now that that nowadays we are seeing that there has been a lot of transportation development, a lot of transportation roads are being developed. So it usually happens that a tree comes in between the design uh, path of the road, whether it be a black top or white top, um, any road. So that tree comes in between. So now they have developed a tree spade machine or sometime also called tree transplanting machine. So what it does that that machine takes the tree from the root and it transplants it somewhere. So basically we are not cutting it. We are giving it another chance and by putting the tree at some other place so that it doesn't block the major area. So this has been a very remarkable step and it has been implemented. Uh, it's not just that uh, it has been in there in the books. It has been implemented. It has been made in use and many trees has been transplanted almost off from those national highways which have been done in last five to ten years, uh, if you see. Uh, and this uh, machine, which is still uh, engineering marvel, has been used to do that. So we don't need to cut the trees anymore to, to get a path for the roads. And even in other places where there is, there is a need to develop an industry, there is a need to develop some buildings. So still these practices are being done. And these practices help in maintaining the ecology of the environment. And uh, also the government has developed uh, something called ngt i think i hope you may be knowing that it is national green tribunal so there has been now a tribunal which takes the cases which takes the recognizance of the people or the uh, uh, community which are harming trees if somebody is harming trees they take the cognizance of those cases and they uh, the the show they put a show cause notice to those organizations and they ask why you have done this so there is a kind of they have the responsibility also so they are organization which has been developed which take the responsibility of these things coming to the other thing so as you might be knowing that many rivers in the northern part of the india has been in very bad shape uh, there has been a lot many reasons who can't say only one one uh, most importantly the release of the sewage untreated sewage into the rivers was one of the major reason the second major reason used to be the release of untreated industrial water so those water was very highly acidic either very basic or had uh, um, uh, or less inorganic and more or uh, less organic and more inorganic content which can't be uh, which can't be uh, means like filtered or which can't be processed by the natural water. So release of these chemical substances in the uh, rivers, they had made the rivers very polluted. And the water for those rivers were very was very polluted, even very far away at the downstream end. So because uh, from the history, we have seen that most of the civilizations have been developed near the rivers or at the banks of the rivers. So these rivers are also a source of drinking water for many villages which are nearby so that was causing problem for those villages nearby villages so there had uh, this uh, recent mission on the uh, way to clean ganga river which is there and kind of a large longest river in the uh, northern peninsula so this river has this nation this has made a national mission to clean this river and has been done a quite good amount of work and that is still going so the river has around some 2300 kilometer of uh, course so it has to they has to do the um, uh, this uh, cleaning process for all the uh, stretches so the mission has been uh, taken in a positive sense and it has some positive impact so there is one famous uh, gangetic dolphin is there which is there in the uh, river ganga if you go in the ganga in the uh, after the uh, city of the Kanpur, from Alaba, Kanpur, this city is, uh, area, if you go, you will find the Gangetic Dolphin. So this pollution in the river was causing problem to the aquatic life of the Ganga River. And there is this distinct aquatic dolphins. They were being extinct. Uh, they were at, at a position of getting extinct. So these missions had helped them a lot. And they, the mission is still there. It is going on. And this will probably be a better 
uh, will result in a probably a cleaner Ganga at a later stage. So that was also another step. Then you might have heard about the recent steps on saving the soil. So as I told earlier, so soil is very important uh, and uh, that uh, the ingredients of the soil, which are very important for the development of the growth of plants, trees. So if they are not in a proper quantity in the soil, then the soil has no use. First of all, for the plant, uh, uh, for the generation of food grains or yield. Second sense, as I told, if soil doesn't have proper shear capacity, so whenever will it will rain, the top surface of the soil will get eroded and soil will erode. So that will remove all important uh, constituents which should be there in the soil. This is also one of the problems. So there has been a mission on this saving soil and that mission is also being to plant more trees and uh, to, uh, to maintain the courses of the river so that the river flows in a way so that it should not flood and there should be flood mitigating um, devices should be placed in there so that the flood should not cause the erosion of the soil and then to increase the uh, quality of the soil by various other manners so this also a very important aspect because it directly impacts the humanity as we are dependent on direct producers which are com coming directly from the soil so that is also one of the aspects now, if you see, so my, you might have studied in your environmental sciences that there was this famous case of London smog, which happened in 1952, and which was of, uh, of, of a, if I say correctly, that it was a, if it was an outcome of the excessive industrialization happened between uh, 1900 to 1940s, so in the European countries. So due to that excessive industrialization, because of the reason that at that time, the mostly ab uh, like abundantly available fuel was the coal, which was there to, uh, uh, to, to, to move those machines, which were there in those industries. And as you know, when you burn coal, the carbon dioxide also releases. And if the coal is not burned properly, I mean, if, if the combustion process is not complete, then it also releases some portion of CO, CO that is carbon monoxide, which is highly, uh, uh, highly dangerous gas uh, as a human being is concerned. So uh, due to this thing, this excessive release of carbon dioxide from the coal, burning of coal in the, in the industrial era, it caused a lot of concentration and what happened in the winter days when it was already winter and the temperature came down so this caused the production of smog okay so it is the smog word has been uh, has been uh, made as a, as a combination of two words that is smoke plus fog so as you know as you might have seen sometime in your life there is fog when you get up early in the morning, very early, you see a little mist that is fog. And the smoke, you see, when you burn something, it causes the smoke. The burning of anything cause, releases the smoke. So these two terms combinedly forms the smog. And this smog is highly, uh, uh, highly uh, problematic for the humankind. Why it is that? Because it causes various health issues. If you go only in the smog, if I uh, so in the fog, if I take the example of fog, fog is nothing but the water particles which are there in the air and which are uh, in a very light temperature, so that they are suspending as very fine particles, and you see them as uh, smog, as a fog. So it is water basically in fog. But what happens in smog? Because you know smoke is not. Uh, uh, it is it is not something which has water it smoke has particles very fine particles and those particles are obtained from the emissions so emissions could be like burning most important emission is the burning of fossil fuels so when this smoke which has particles emitted from the burning of fossil fuels it has sulfur particles it has carbon particles those particles when combined with water they create this smog and the properties 
of this smog are neither of the smoke neither of the fog because fog is not a problem for humans smoke is problematic but the proper nature of smoke is it rises too early because the smoke is higher in temperature it has high temperature so because of its high temperature it it's have a little light weight and it moves upward so it moves upwards in the atmosphere so if if you if you might have seen in your childhood also if you burn a piece of paper you see the smoke rising up it never goes down it always rises up so as i told the property of smog is not of the smoke or the uh, fog so because when it combines the density of the smog becomes little bit higher and it loses the capability to rise upward so what happens it just remains at where it is it just remains at where it is and it doesn't even clear so that is the problem with the smog and it keeps that area for continuously for a very long time and it has been in the in the news that the london smog remained there for some 15 to 20 days even more more number of days so and when you don't have sunlight available so then how difficult it is for the humans to uh, survive because you don't have the sunlight because we are inherently uh, dependent on the sunlight so if we don't get the sunlight properly then there is will be problems so this london smog caused this problem it spread all over the london and it didn't move from that area it didn't go so you know that when sunlight came the fog the water in the fog vaporizes and goes away but that didn't happen because it creates a very thick layer of the smog and the sun can't penetrate through that layer so that go made was most importantly the problem and the similar issues we saw in the capital city of india in new delhi that the uh, smog was there especially after deepavali when some uh, stubble burning happens in nearby places some cracker burning so these issues were causing some of the smoke which when condenses with the waters it causes that smoke so we had this idea to use the water cannons so we had this anti smoke gun which just nothing but sprays the water with some of the chemicals which are not harmful for humans but when they react with the smog or smoggy water they remove that smog and clears the sky so this water gun was extensively used in the has been used in the past 4 uh, to 5 years in those cities where this problem has been constantly there of this smog so it has been a technological development and we had found some of the one of the way to do that okay to we can say mitigate it has already happened but we had developed something which can mitigate that effect so there these things are very important and we have to take care so these all steps which i told you they have been made after we faced some problem okay so whenever we faced the problem we came for a solution we came up with a solution and try to implement it and then how that's how we proceeded but that should not be there okay so it should not be this way all the time we we can't say that every time then there will be some problem then only we will proceed forward to find some solution we should be able to have the uh, the inner judgment to implement it before beforehand so that we should not if we should not be at a stage that these problems like smog or uh, other things should be created and that's how the sustainability is very important so there only the sustainability comes and specifically to our profession of civ as a civil engineer we need to take care of this in our practices in our materials which we are using so that the construction which is being done at a particular site should remain sustainable as maximum as possible as maximum sustainable the construction you can do should be there and that has been a challenge it has been a challenge there are certain uh, things which causes this challenge i'll get to those things but these challenges can be uh, overcome by proper guidance by proper understanding of the subject as well as by proper research because we need a lot of understanding we need to develop a lot of understanding by doing more research if you will do more research on these concepts on these things we will get better understanding than how to come up with some certain ideas which can stop this problem so now coming to the 
sustainability in the construction so what we saw till now was a background that what is sustainability how uh, natural resources are playing very important role in that okay because the pool of natural resources is constant for our lives and if we use it excessively it will be less for our future generation not only to that and above on the above of that we are also facing some of the issues which are contemporarily happening in our life and are because of the excessive use of these resources so there is a need to minimize the use of those resource there is a need to come up with the solutions if there is a problem and there is a need to tackle these problems at front means to tackle these problems from the beginning okay so there we are here now that in the order to tackle the problem from the beginning now the comes in this now we comes in the sustainability part of the construction practices or construction material or construction as it as a whole subject okay so that is how it is important because whatever we are doing in our construction practices i will tell you a little more about it now so whatever we are doing it is going to impact what we have studied till now it is going to cause some of the things which we are doing which we have studied till now somewhere it will be doing that so that is very important so we have to look this uh, sustainability aspect in the construction or in the materials required for the construction in a manner that how to avoid the uh, uh, the generation of some of the waste product by products or any such things which is going to add to the problems of these which we have seen which have which causes um, unsustainable development okay so that is will be our goal from now onwards okay so if we see the what is sustainability in construction so how i can say uh, uh, what it means uh, on and, and how to how to measure it or how to implement it what what does it impact so we can say that activities of human beings like one of the activities of human beings are construction okay so it is also having an impact on the environment okay so if i give you a very small example so if suppose some we, we have to develop a four story building at a particular site which is right now is covered with the thick forest okay and we have to develop a four square four story building there of uh, suppose uh, 20 meter wide and 50 meter length wise okay that is the dimension the outer dimension and that building we have to construct there but the site is right now is under forest area I means it is fully uh, trees are there so in order to develop that in order to construct that building first we have to remove that 50 into 20 cross 50 cross 20 square area uh, we have to remove the trees we have to cut so what used to happen earlier we used to cut those trees we will cut those trees and we'll use the timber from those trees in the construction process that used to happen now what happened now we as you see that we have some equipment which we don't need to cut the tree we can relocate the tree so we can re relocate the tree from one place to another now what it is doing when we are not cutting the tree and we are relocating it we are not changing the ecology of the environment of the local environment we are not changing that we are not disturbing it and that is the way the sustainability works so we have to think those ways so that the impact of our activity on the environment should be minimum that is the sustainability the impact of our activity our activity is the construction activity so the impact of our activity on the environment should be minimum and that's how we say that it is a sustainable construction okay and this has many aspects as i told it could be in construction practices it could be in the material which we are using in construction it could be also that the way we are approaching to the process of construction okay so the way we are approaching the process of construction that could also be a very important aspect okay so i will discuss it little more that how this is how very small small steps are also going to impact this okay now so the the sustainable construction by and large the sustainable construction will mean that building with renewable and recyclable resources and material so we should be able to build with those materials which are renewable okay which are recyclable okay so the resources which you are getting 
or the materials which you are using those should be renewable and recyclable at most or and we should be able to do in a manner that we should impact the environment very less okay so for an example so we can say that during the construction project okay we can take care that to reduce the waste and energy consumption so we can reduce the waste and as well as energy consumption where possible and this will protect the natural environment around the site okay so as i told you by reducing the uh, by not cutting the trees and by simply relocating those trees from one place to another we can do that one way is that that we can do the other way is we can reduce the energy required in the construction process we can plan our construction process in a manner in which it requires least amount of energy third we can say we reduce the waste product from the construction so whatever every construction uh, uh, activity produces some amount of waste so instead wasting then waste amount we can again reuse that product which has which is a waste which is a by byproduct or a waste at somewhere else in the same project or in the same construction site so that that is being used properly there and the problem of waste also also is reduced because if we generate more waste we need the waste management system also we need to have a waste management system to uh, get away with that waste okay to uh, to uh, disperse that waste so in order to avoid that we can do what we can reduce the waste first of all and if that waste is generated we can reuse it somewhere else that is more important so so in the construction process so we as there has been some certain amount of researches so we can say that the research in the from those research we can say that the building and construction works in some of the countries like these countries like which are a part of this organization which is organization for economic cooperation and development and the india is not there in this group and it, this group mostly contains european countries and the american and latin american countries so there are th oh, total 38 countries in this group so if we look these figures if we look these figures so you see the percentage here shown is the percentage of that particular quantity which is written only used in the construction projects building and construction okay it is very important you see so the total energy so these 38 countries whatever total energy they are producing that 25 to 40 percent of the total energy they are using in their building and construction works means one fourth even more than one fourth okay if i go with the lower minimum also one fourth 25 percent is one fourth of the total energy produced by these 38 countries is being used in the construction and building second the raw materials so all the raw materials which are there all the raw materials which are there 30 percent of that raw material is being consumed in the construction site all the raw materials it could be um, your cement it could be your uh, bricks it could be plastic uh, it could be rubber anything 30 percent of that is being approximately 30 percent is being used in the construction projects third 30 to 40 percent of the global greenhouse gases emission so i told you that greenhouse gas like co2 co co2 these gases have the capability to absorb the sun rays and they increase the temperature of the earth so you can see that the construction activities which are there they are producing around 30 to 40 percent of the global greenhouse gas emission so it is too much means contribution it is global greenhouse emission in these 38 countries so you can see how huge impact this building and construction work can have on the environment and that is why sustainability in the civil engineering background is most important part this is the most you can you can literally judge from here that why i am saying is more serious i am that is correct that these steps has to be equally taken by mechanical electrical computer science and every other civil engineering where the prime focus is on the infrastructural development and which requires a lot of energy lot of effort lot of materials because of that it also causes a lot of problem to the society or the country or the world so that's how we have to improve our include sustainable practices so that we are not harming our environment 
अब अब पर्टिकुलर सर्टिन लेवल वी कैन नॉट गो फॉर जीरो परसेंट दैट आई अग्री बट वी शुड बी विद इन द लिमिट्स सो यू कैन सी दैट थर्टी टू फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द ग्लोबल ग्रीन हाउस गैसेज आर बीन एमिटेड यूजिंग इन दी बिल्डिंग एंड कंस्ट्रक्शन वर्क एंड फाइनल इज थर्टी टू फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द सॉलिड वेल्थ जनरेशन सो वट एवर सॉलिड वेस्ट जनरेशन हैपन्स दैट हैपन्स देयर इन द बिल्डिंग एंड कंस्ट्रक्शन वर्क थर्टी टू फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ द टोटल सो दिस गिवस अस अ फेयर आइडिया दैट वाई द सस्टेनेबिलिटी इन द कंस्ट्रक्शन इज देयर and it is not only the material aspect it could be other yeah our presentation our our the 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 focus of this uh, lecture is mostly on materials but before the going down because material is a sub part of that why i am saying that the material being is sub part of that of the whole construction process so i will go to the material parts but we have to look this very carefully because some of you could be very interested in these topics and this basically comes under building technology and uh, concrete research or uh, construction management so this topic mostly comes under either building technology and construction management or in the environmental engineering so this topic is very important in that sense that we have to do the developmental work uh, uh, infrastructure development but with the caution that we should not make our environment more dirtier or more polluted okay so now there is a concept called something in sustainable construction is uh, green building uh, it is a it is a new term some of you might have read it some of you might have not known it so we'll discuss about it what it means so what uh, green building means is 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 a green building green from outside or or something else is there the meaning of green building so what is the concept of that we'll going to we are going to see so green building which we also can call as a green construction or a sustainable building it refers to uh, both a structure and the application of the process so you carefully read this line that it means both a structure structure in, in itself okay the structure of the building and the application of processes that are in application of the processes so the application of the processes are the processes through which the structure has been constructed so it is not just the final structure should be green also the processes through which we have achieved that construction should also be green that are environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout a building's life cycle okay so there are two terms here i have underlined one is environmentally responsible okay so what it means that we have to do uh the processes which were involved in the uh in the construction should be chosen in a manner or should be planned in a manner that 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 it should be environmentally responsible we should not be bluntly towards uh doing these activities and second is role resource efficient that whatever resources we have sh we should use them efficiently okay we we can't say that okay there is a lot of abundance of resource and we can Uh, uh use the resource very casually no so we have to use those resources very efficiently and environmentally responsible should be the construction throughout a building's life cycle so it is not now what this last mean is throughout the building's life like life cycle is that that you don't call a building even if you constructed it using the processes which are environmentally friendly and you made the structure of the building also a monthly friendly no it does not mean that you cannot say that i have achieved these two goals so that building is a green building it should also maintain these two requirements of environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout the cycle or throughout the life of that building okay throughout the life of that building if you have designed that building for 50 years so for the 50 years that building should use minimum resources should be self sufficient should be environmentally responsible should you are not generate excessive waste and should have a very less impact on the environment locally okay so what are the cycles so now the cycles of the buildings are shown here you can see the cycles what are the cycles in the life of a building so it is from planning to design you plan then you design then comes the construction then after that comes the operation then comes the maintenance 
and then comes the renovation after certain year of uh, like some uh, 60% or 70% of the life cycle has uh, passed then we renovate the building sometime or even before if it is requires renovation we renovate it till the time it is usable uh, or functional and then we do the demolition we when it is no more functional it is demolished so that is the concept of green building okay so it doesn't mean that the building should look like green okay that only is the criteria for the building to be a green building the building should be environmentally responsible it should be resource efficient so that uh, not only in the construction phase or its uh, commissioning or operation phase but throughout the lifespan of the building okay also the green buildings refers to saving resources to the maximum extent so if if we are going to construct the building in a way that it saves the resources to a maximum extent possible that is also it can refer as a green building including saving energy so there are certain ways in which we can construct a building after which you can just save the energy so here i will give a very easy example of this so what happens that uh, we need uh, illumination so when we work in the daytime we need light okay we need light to work to write read type do any activity we need light so there are certain aspects while the designing phase of the building when we plan we prepare the plans or the drawings of the building if we orient the building in a sense that the sunlight which we are getting in the daytime is sufficient to do the activities in the particular uh, areas without need of the artificial lightning then it is a green building because we don't need energy to put the light switch on to to uh, on the tube light or to light a bulb to work because the natural illumination of the sun is more than sufficient to do the or perform that task so these types of things causes what it causes saving in energy because you are not using energy and energy saved is a very good cause so that's how you can say or you can say that is a green building one example of saving energy another example i will give sometime when we are in a region where the wind flow is very frequent and the wind also flows throughout the year in a particular direction and at a particular average speed so what can be done that certain building can be oriented or placed in a manner that it gives the full uh, uh, ventilation of the building space without the need of air conditioning it doesn't require air conditioning it just fully ventilates the rooms or uh, cabins in that building so that it has to be placed or it has to be oriented in a manner so that the wind should pass through it so this is also one of the major thing because if you don't use the air conditioning you are saving the electricity you are not polluting the uh, air by releasing carbon uh, chlorofluorocarbons which is again saving the environment so that is one way. then third is the thing here is the land saving so we had uh, energy saving we have land saving can save land so building done in a vertical sense not the spreading we, we don't need to spread it into very large area and then build only first one or two story it is efficient to build building in a small base area with higher number of stories so that will cause lesser use of the land area okay then uh, is the water saving so there has been numerous cases where the building which uh, the building generates certain amount of waste water and then this waste water is treated and used again by the building in the owner of the building or the residents of the building so the waste water is generated is recycled and then used again so there is no dependency so the waste water the water we don't need okay we that particular building occupants are using the same water and they are recycling it so that is also one of the way and then the material saving okay so putting uh, excessive 
sturdy construction where the beam depth is not required of suppose the beam depth required is 230 mm or 240 mm but it has been given or by the con contractor or by the engineer concerned or by the uh, architect around 500 mm unnecessary that is a very sturdy construction because uh, recent recent times we are using limit state method so we uh, again have lesser less bulkier construction than the working state method so because we are using the probabilistic thing of failure okay so there the the dimensions of the various structural element has been reduced but if you if we were if we still use them in the higher dimension then it is going to have excessive material which is going to add excessive mass and unnecessarily the material will be wasted because it is not going to be used throughout its lifetime so that is also more important so during the whole life cycle of the building protecting the environment and reducing the pollution providing people with the with healthy comfortable and efficient use of space and being in harmony with the nature so this is the last point is very important because we have discussed all other the last point is very important that being in harmony with the nature so that is very important so uh, what it seems that or what it meant is here that these green buildings they remain in harmony with the nature because they do not pose any major impact on the nearby environment okay as i as i described these buildings so they don't pose a major impact on the nearby uh, environment and that is why they remain in harmony with the nature okay so that is more important so i can give you certain examples okay there are certain examples of these green buildings so first one is from the itc green center in golgaon okay so that is also a green building so as i told that green building need not to be a green in color okay so there are certain ways they are a green so uh, it is possible that maybe they achieve some of the objective which have been laid down okay so we have to see which objectives have been taken which have not been taken but uh, in totality some of the objectives are there second is the olympia tech park in chennai that is in chennai then these two buildings so basically these two buildings i thought as as an example to you to how the buildings uh, should be constructed in a manner that it should reduce the impact on the surrounding environment now there is also a challenge with this sustainable uh, construction so there are challenges with the sustainable construction the first challenge which comes is that the sustainable construction being expensive and that is also true in some uh extend because you have to make use of some materials which are not very traditional or which are not being used very frequently so the cost of procuring those materials are higher than the other materials okay and because of that reason the construction cost goes up so that could that is one of the fair point of our challenge in the construction of sustainable construction that being expensive so this is the second point as i have already uh, told so higher material cost even in the sustainable construction uh, that uh, expensive sustainable construction also means the processes of the practices involved in doing so is also high not only the material the process or the activities are also high whatever activity you achieve through a particular process if you are going through a, a sustainability point of view then it could be higher price okay then the technicalities involved in the construction process so it is i would say it is fair to say that uh, the the many people in india are not trained for this for the construction with the sustainability in their mind so construction has been done for the past these many years with a particular way of saying saving time and uh, money and energy mostly so time money especially was the two major constraint so the most of the construction projects um, were managed by considering these two as their constraints so that is why the technicalities are not there much in the sustainable construction field because of its expensive nature and that's why there is a need for that then the lack of research and development so we need to have more research we need to come up with the better materials which are more environmental friendly can be used in the construction sites or in construction of various structural elements of the building and then they should uh, be at a let should be available at a lesser cost so this is also very much required and then we have inadequate awareness about the process 
so we don't have many of the people don't have awareness of the process how to achieve it and um, this is also a problem when we don't have awareness we usually tend to not use it okay so that is there so the uh, benefits if we see what are the benefits because if something we are doing it should have some benefits so we have the environmental benefit so if you are using a renewable energy and uh, using some of the renewable building material or material which do not impact the environment much so we can fight the climate change okay the climate change which is happening we can fight it we can stop the climate change and the greener building will also will provide a waste management animation so it will also improve the waste management which is there and uh, it will reduce the waste produced and also it will reduce the emissions so these most of the green buildings uh, also have this rooftop uh, solar panels so this rooftop solar panel captures the energy from the top and uh, uh, from the sun and then it converts it into energy which is used by the uh, tenants or by the by the occupants of that building okay so they need lesser energy from the outside outside means the energy uh, obtained from various subsidiaries of the government which is the which we are using currently so this rooftop uh, solar panels helps a lot uh, because the solar energy is a renewable source of energy but the energy which we are getting from the government is the uh, is uh, either produced by coal uh, or it is produced by uh, nuclear power mostly by coal okay mostly by coal and then hydropower so that is there second is the financial benefit so as i mentioned in the last point that there is a challenge that the practices are uh, the construction practices using sustainability is are, are expensive some of the materials are also expensive but in a longer run if you see because buildings are not constructed for a period of one or two years they are constructed for a design life of 50 or 60 or even 100 years so if you see that in a long run it saves a lot of money how so the sustainable construction is sometimes criticized for using expensive materials but green buildings are often considered are more valuable than traditional ones so those which are considered constructed traditional they are more valuable now data have shown that they achieve a 7% increase in their value over the traditional building so uh, they there has been research that the value of the green building increases at least 7% over the traditional buildings and plus there is saving on the utility bills so you don't need energy from outside you are getting your own energy renewable source sun then you don't need the to manage your uh, waste you are not whatever waste you are generating you are managing yourself then third is the emissions so whatever emissions you are generating they are manageable so this reduces the utility bill okay and are more likely through sustainable construction projects so this are been done so this also uh, uh, give a financial benefit but the problem is we have to look at it in a longer run we can't say it for a shorter period of time and it is not fair also to judge it in a shorter period of time and also we have social benefits from that so not only does the sustainable construction mean improved health for the people who are using the building it also been shown that to improve workers productivity it improves workers productivity during construction and due to the better surrounding better work environment and the noise protection so these are some of the benefits which we get from the construction of uh, green buildings or you can say sustainable construction uh, uh, vis-a-vis the normal traditional construction so these things should be kept in mind before even designing or planning some building so i will give you a just few figures okay uh, not going much deep in the material aspect as i told earlier i will be taking material in the part 2 here i am mostly taking talking about the process basically so just a glimpse i will give you to from this chart you can see cement is a very important construction material as a cement engineer for us very important so you can see how the production has increased from 1994 to 2014 for the Uh, uh, uh for the uh, cement production worldwide okay so production is on the y axis with million tons and the years on the x axis sorry yeah y axis and uh, years on the x axis so you can see that it was 
at the most in china around uh, 2500 million tons in 2000 i think uh, 14 and uh, it was for india i think it was around 250 million tons okay so uh, you can say 10 times the china has been preparing may producing even 10 times than us now there is an important fact okay so the carbon dioxide is a byproduct of a chemical conversion process used in the production of clinker i hope the second year students which are there they might have gone through this the production of cement how cement is produced and they use they should know this term clinker okay they should know this term clinker so uh, uh, i hope they can see this so uh, this this clinker term here is one of the important uh, product while construction cement while making preparing cement and it uh, there is a problem when we reduce the lime which is caco3 to cao lime uh, limestone to cao lime there is a release of co2 gas and this gas as i told you is added again to the environment okay so it adds again to the environment and it is being produced also co2 is emitted from the fossil fuels used in the production of the cement so everywhere the in the plant wherever the plants are there they are not all are the electricity fed there some of the plants are coal fed and even the electricity which are being provided there is being coal fired electricity so fossil fuels are also burning to get the production of the cement so now the problem comes is in the next see the estimated it is estimated that for 1 kg of cement produced, around 0.5 to 0.9 kg of CO2 is emitted. Now you see, 1 kg of cement is emitting this much carbon dioxide. And it is inclusive of both. The carbon dioxide emitted from the process here, which is shown in the point number one, and the process in the, uh, as the fuel, which has been burning. So because of that, so including both, it produces around 0.5 to 0.9 kg for per kg cement produced. CO2 which is emitted in environment. So you just see how much cement the world is uh, total is making around more than uh, 4,300 million ton per year. Okay, it is this much is it's making 4,300 million ton. And if I multiply that with to convert it into kg and then multiply that with a factor of if I average it, I would say uh, 0.7. If I multiply with a factor of 0.7, that much kg of the CO2 gas is emitted. So that is the impact we can put, or a civil engineer, the material we are going to use can put on the environment. So it is a general understanding amongst common people that the more cement you use, the more strength you get. First of all, this is a very wrong. Uh, assumption it is not like that because the more use of cement i'm not saying in the aspect of co2 also i'm saying the more cement you use in a construction the more sinkage cracks can occur first of all and the cramped concrete is of no use the concrete is of use only when it is uncramped okay so cracked concrete is of no use and increasing in the concern uh, cement content cracks the concrete if it is not properly cured and usually it is not properly cured curing by water i'm saying cured means curing by water so considering that aspect and considering the aspect that it creates this much of co2 so you can see the impact the construction activities are doing or having on the process because all the construction which is happening around the happening around the world use cement cement is the basic need it is the most important binder okay so also the 90 percent of the energy required for cement manufacture is obtained from the fossil Okay, so 90% of the energy is coming from this fossil. So estimated that CO2 emission from the cement industry is 5% of the overall global emission. Whatever globally emission is happening of CO2, 5% is from the cement industry. Okay. <clears throat> so coming to the materials which can be used in the sustainable construction. So the major important, or I can say these are the qualities of the material. See, these, this is the characters of the material. So if you want to judge something, you can say from this, from here. So the character should be, it should be renewable energy. The energy which you are going to use in the process of construction should be renewable. Using on-site water treatment plants to minimize waste. So you should have on-site water treatment plants to minimize the waste. Okay, as I told earlier, in the definition of the green building. And recycling 
and building with renewable or waste material is very important. I am sorry for this uh, C, it is a, a, a typo there. So yeah, recycling and building with renewable or waste material is very important for achieving the sustainable construction. So I am going to focus mostly on these three aspects in the next uh, class when we'll come together. So we'll focus on this and how, which material we can use and how it affects the, um, uh, the sustainability of the process of the construction and of the project as a whole. Okay. So uh, I, I, I'm sorry if I have taken a little more time um, uh, and thank you for the your patient listening. And if you have any questions to ask from the part which we have discussed, uh, I'm happy to answer. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Students, any questions? So I guess uh, there are no questions, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for organizing this and having this in a very smooth sense. I really appreciate your help, sir. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. See you soon, sir.